Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to the Roots Tech 2024 MC, Kirby Hayborn. Yay! Woohoo! How is this crowd over here? Are you guys good? I just noticed you're all so very kind and, and, and reverent looking just that way. And I sometimes think, why are they not looking at me? I'm over here, but I'm over there too. So I look a little better over there, a lot taller. Thank you everybody for coming back. Today is Roots Tech, day number two of the 2024 Roots Tech by Family Search. Super excited to be here. I am Kirby. I don't know if you remember from before, but I'm the same guy. Uh, so excited to be here again, and we are back for more. I hope that you've been diving deep into everything that Roots Tech has to offer, because believe it or not, after today, pull out your tissues, there's only one more day left. It's so sad, and we talked about it yesterday, that you look forward to this. Once it ends, you look forward to the next year. It's so amazing, the connections that we make. Before we jump into today's incredible lineup, I have something very special to share with you. Are you ready for it? Good, because <laughs> I'm going to tell you whether you're ready or not. It's time to talk about the global watch parties happening right now. That's right, all around the world, families and friends are tuning in to experience Roots Tech. So to all our viewers joining in from every corner of the globe, a big warm welcome to you too. Let's give it to them. Let's see what Roots Tech attendees are up to in Rome, Italy. That's where we're gonna go. Ciao Roots Tech, this is Marco Ferrini from Italy. And today I'm excited to join all of you from the Family Research Center in Rome. This year we decided to organize this watch party here at the Family Search Center to share the experience and create a new experience where people can come watch Roots Tech and also get help directly from the consultants to move forward with their family history. Thank you for letting us stop by. It is a pleasure and an honor to always be a part of this worldwide Rootstack family. Ciao. Isn't that amazing? We just think it's just all about us here in this room, but it's across the world, everybody is a part of this. We're a part of something so much bigger than we can see. First up today, we're thrilled to have MyHeritage with us. They are the leading global platform for exploring family history. MyHeritage offers sophisticated family tree technologies, billions of easily searchable historical records, and is home to the world's best technologies for improving historical photos. Super cool. And they are the innovators of making discovery appealing to everyone, from the most devout researchers to casual viewers. Please join me in welcoming the Vice President of Marketing from my heritage, Aaron Godfrey. Yes. Hello, Rootstech. I'm Aaron. Nice to see you. I'm Aaron Godfrey, VP Marketing of My Heritage, and it's wonderful to be back here on the Salt Palace stage. Now, friends, please don't let my accent distract you because I have some incredible My Heritage updates that I want you to hear. Whether your family story is deeply rooted in the US or began halfway across the globe, My Heritage is proud to be part of your journey. We believe in the power of genealogy to change people's lives for the better and are committed to developing amazing products and features that take your family history research to the next level. This past year, we took innovative genealogy further than ever before with the addition of powerful AI features. AI Biographer lets you create a Wikipedia-like biography for any ancestor using AI enriched with information from your family tree historical context, photos, and footnotes. In just two months since the launch, more than 100,000 biographies have been created. Thank you. AI Record Finder, also launched two months ago, lets you find historical records easily through an interactive chat. It's the world's first AI conversation-based search engine for historical records. Think of it as a chat GPT for genealogy. 
You can count on my heritage to continue to innovate in AI and other areas and push the boundaries of what's possible in genealogy. The MyHeritage Wiki is a new community-led online encyclopedia for genealogy and DNA. New collaborators are welcome, so please go to myheritage.com slash wiki to explore and register. And just this week, we reached the incredible milestone of 20 billion global historical records on MyHeritage. Thank you. Now, among the most popular sections on my heritage are family tree profile pages. And yesterday, we released newly improved ones. We've transformed profiles into a central hub for everything known about an individual in your family tree. This update includes the introduction of hints. Hints indicate the life events and close relatives from smart matches and record matches that are missing in your tree and that you can easily add. You can confirm hints and take the information without leaving the page. There are many new cool features, so I invite you to visit your MyHeritage account today to check it out. And if for some reason you don't yet have a MyHeritage account, there's never been a better time to sign up. Next week, we'll add our AI-powered photo scanner to the MyHeritage mobile app. So you can scan entire album pages or individual photos in seconds. Then you can use MyHeritage's amazing photo features to colorize and enhance your photos. Thank you. <laughs> On MyHeritage DNA, we've added mandatory two-factor authentication to increase your security. But this made it challenging to get help from a DNA expert. Well, you asked, and we've listened. And later this month, you'll be able to invite another MyHeritage user to view your DNA results to help you unlock your discoveries. <laughs> Next month, MyHeritage will launch an exciting new product integration with our friends at Family Tree DNA. FTDNA users will be able to transfer their family trees to MyHeritage in just a few clicks and benefit from all of our exciting genealogy features and historical records. <laughs> Told you there's a lot. Continuing the theme of you asked and we've listened, a major update is coming to our DNA ethnicity results soon. This summer, we will be releasing a superior ethnicity model that is two years in the making. The new model expands the estimates from 42 percentage-based ethnicities to 80. The highlights will be in Europe, where we're the strongest DNA service, offering more resolution than any other DNA company. Anyone who tested with MyHeritage since mid-2019 will get the updated ethnicity estimates for free. Thank you. Now, long before the days of social media, People got their news, big and small, from newspapers. Historical newspapers told you about current events, ranging from global world news to who won your local science fair. Well, folks, I have breaking news. Right now, here on this stage, I'm delighted to announce that MyHeritage has released oldnews.com, a brand new website for exploring historical newspapers. Oldnews.com is a treasure trove with hundreds and millions of historical pages from international newspapers to small town journals and gazettes. Introducing oldnews.com, a vast online archive of millions of historical newspapers from all over the world. Dive into the headlines that shaped your family's story. Access a treasure trove of historical newspapers where you'll gain new insights into your ancestors' lives and watch as stories from the past unfold. Explore the stories that made history at oldnews.com. If you think the video is cool, wait till you see the website. Oldnews.com more than doubles the amount of historical newspapers previously available on MyHeritage and offers new and unique content. It includes publications from the English-speaking world, Europe and Australia, and that's just the beginning. Millions of pages are added monthly, and newspapers from more countries will be added in the future. You are all invited to visit oldnews.com today. 
You can access oldnews.com with a standalone subscription or with a brand new MyHeritage Omni plan, which is a one-stop shop for genealogy. As well as old news, Omni gives full access to all features and content on MyHeritage, a Genie.com Pro plan, thousands of genealogy and DNA webinars on legacy family tree webinars, and unlimited photo scanning using MyHeritage's mobile apps. We have a special DNA upload promotion running for this week only. If you've tested with another service, you can upload your DNA to MyHeritage between now and March 4th and get free access forever to our market-leading advanced DNA features. Thank you. I invite you to tune in to all the MyHeritage classes available in person and on the RootsTech website. Drop by our booth to meet our team and enjoy exclusive RootsTech discounts, including 50% off all subscriptions. We've also dropped the price on DNA kits at our booth, and you can get yours now for just $33. It has, thank you, man over there who clapped. <laughs> it has once again been my pleasure to be here today to represent my heritage. Thank you for joining me and for welcoming my heritage as part of your genealogy journey. Wishing you good health, good times with the ones you love, and remarkable family history discoveries. Thank you very much. All right, Roots Tech family, isn't my heritage awesome? Big thanks to them for being here. We are so grateful that they're here. Now, folks, we're about to dive into something truly special. Imagine carrying a legacy so profound that it's written into the history books. That's the story of our next speaker, Lynn Jackson. She's not just the great-great-granddaughter of Dred and Harriet Scott, She's a bridge from their fight for freedom into our lives today. So let's get ready to be moved, inspired, and connected through her extraordinary story. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lynn Jackson. Wow. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for attending my session at Roots Tech 2024. Thank you for joining. Thank you for having me. Today, we're going to share a wonderful story that is of remembrance and inspiration. And uh, I'm quite privileged and honored to be the one that gets to share it. In 1995, I heard my Heavenly Father say to me, you should study Dred Scott. And I said out loud, yeah, you know, I should know more than the average person. So I embarked on a study of my own, which in 2007, my earthly father, who you see here, Dr. John Madison Jr., said to me, you are the only one who could do this. And he had been the family historian all the years before. So I embarked on a storyline that I had no clue how important it was. None of us really understood until the 150th anniversary how courageous and how amazing our ancestors really were to do what they did all those many years ago. Dred and Harriet Scott fought for their freedom, which became the freedom of so many other people. But they had an 11-year ordeal with five court proceedings that took them all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, only to hear Chief Justice Tawney say to them, you're not a citizen. He threw the case out. They had no standing in court. And he further said that they had no rights, that whites were bound to respect. And sadly, he said that they were beings of an inferior order, so far inferior, that they shouldn't even associate with the white race. They said some other things that allowed slavery to be coast to coast if it had not been fought. And yet, Dred and Harriet persisted. Dred had been born on the plantation of Peter and Elizabeth Blow in Southampton, Virginia. They had 11 children, and several of them, the three that you see here in particular, Taylor, Henry, and Charlotte, were very instrumental in helping Dred and Harriet all those years of their case. The father had owned slaves, but the children never did. And they even helped Dred 
past his death. As it turns out, it's a wonderful story. I wish we had a little more time, but Dredd and Harriet were actually bought by Taylor Blow with the express purpose of freeing them from the owners that had been holding him. And what you see here, oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think that's pretty special. What you see here is a copy of the freedom licenses that Taylor Blow paid $1,000 each for Dredd and Harriet so that they could exercise their freedom. This is a picture of the old courthouse in St. Louis where on April the 6th, 1846, they started their case, which ended on March 6th of 1857. Their case was a major catalyst for the Civil War. And we all know the history of Abraham Lincoln, although you may not know that he decided not to get out of politics when he heard the Dred Scott decision and consequently became the 16th president. But after the war and after his assassination, he had already put in place for the 13th Amendment to abolish slavery. And then the 14th Amendment overturns the Dred Scott decision in a sense that it gave citizenship to all who were born in America, especially enslaved Americans. And then it wouldn't be right unless you had the 15th Amendment, which gave them the right to vote. Of course, we're talking about men, not women, until 1920. But the Dred Scott Amendments came out of the Dred Scott decision. So fast forward just a little bit, the family history of Dred and Harriet. They had two daughters. You see Eliza and Lizzie, and obviously I descend from one of them. But a funny story is that all the years until we started doing the work for the foundation, we thought it was the wrong daughter. So a wonderful lady in St. Louis, Ruth Ann Hager, a certified genealogist, now retired, wanted to do a brief pamphlet on Harriet. And somehow she was connected with me. I gave her a name. I gave her the name Wilson Madison. Most people did not know. She was able to find the right Harriet, but she found so much more that it turned into this beautiful quintessential book, which is the Dredd and Harriet Scott family story. And it is amazing. We coordinated with it together and other, a few other people helped, but this book tells the family story. And that in itself is a whole nother issue, but it's a beautiful thing. From Dredd Scott and the two daughters, Eliza is my great grandmother. The etching that you see is my great grandfather. So I always tell people the easy way to remember it is that Dred Scott's grandson is my grandfather. His name was John Alexander Madison. In the picture in the center, you see my grandmother, his wife, with four of their seven children. And then the next picture, you see my grandmother again, my mother, and yes, that's me. Little. <laughs> and we are standing at the place where Dred Scott was buried, which happened after he had been at another cemetery. But Taylor Blow moved him from that cemetery, which was about to be abandoned, to Calvary Cemetery. And he lay in an unmarked grave here for 90 years. Father Edward Dowling, a Jesuit priest, was going through the records at Calvary and located Dred Scott just by accident. His his lot number. So he's sharing that with our family. This was in Ebony Magazine about 1957, I believe. And so uh, from that, he said that I would like to erect a small headstone in his honor. However, if anyone ever wants to do more one day, they will at least know where he lie. So from that, we were able to get this beautiful marker. And it was about 28 inches high, 24 inches wide. That's my dad and my uncle Dred Scott laying a wreath for the first time that Dred Scott's grave had ever been marked since his death. And so from that time, Mrs. Harrison decided that she, as a granddaughter of Taylor Blow, wanted to be the one to buy that marker, and she did so. The lady you see there is Susan Blow, by the way, who was the granddaughter of Henry Blow, and thank you for that. And she is the woman who started the first kindergarten in the United States. So that's part of the Blow family. Beautiful people they are. 
This is a family portrait. It's really the only heirloom we have. It's a charcoal drawing of Dredd and Harriet. I don't have the exact date on it, but we think it goes back at least to 1860 because it was found with one of the boys, one of the grandsons of Dred Scott as they sat as orphans on a curb. And this is very special. Thanks to Linda Bug Sims and Jim Vincent, we have from the Dred Scott, I'm sorry, from the Blow Family Bible, a line that says, Sam, a Negro boy born from a son of January of 1756. What people don't know is that Dred Scott was born Sam Blow. And so in the family Bible, they recorded their slaves. And the gentleman who owned the Bible also told his family that they should not uh, treat their slaves poorly. And as you can see, they did not. This is a copy of our family Bible that Grandmother Grace passed on to me. It's over a thousand pictures in this page, 2,000 page Bible, and I treasure it. In 2006, I started the Dred Scott Heritage Foundation to commemorate the 150th anniversary. And from that, we decided that commemoration, education, and reconciliation would be our pillars. And of course, that came from upstairs too. So we commemorated it as well as we erected the first and only statue of Dredd and Harriet Scott, which is outside the old courthouse in St. Louis. <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> Education speaks for itself, but reconciliation is a very powerful thing that we do. The sons and daughters of reconciliation are represented here, and you can see that we have descendants from Jefferson Davis, Thomas Jefferson, Dred Scott, as well as the Blow family, and not only that, but the Tawney family. In 2017, uh, Charlie Tawney, a great-great-nephew of Justice Tawney, did a public apology to our family and to all people, and we did that in front of the statue of his ancestor. Fast-forwarding, we also have... <laughs> I'm not doing that, I'm sorry. Back to the next screen. So fast forwarding, we are sharing the new headstone. Remember Father Dowling said, if anyone ever wants to do more, they at least know where he lies. So it had always been in my heart that people should know him, and the marker did not say much. So this one was erected on September 30th in Calvary Cemetery. It is engraved on the front and the back. His image is there, scriptures are there. We were trying to do it on September 17th because that's the day he died. It has subsequently become Constitution Day, and for that reason, we honor him with a nine-foot-high black granite, 10 by 10. And let me say this, Taylor Blow bought three grave sites, so this would be here today because back then you could not bury a black person next to a white person. So what the devil meant for evil, God meant for good. <laughs> Yeah. It's been 18 years, and I can only tell you the journey has been a miracle. So the one thing on this page I want to share with you is that there is no stamp of Dred Scott. We should all say boo, because that's disgraceful. And yet we have to have a petition drive signature petition drive, so we invite you to do that and help us to get those signatures in and influence the powers that be because Red Scott should have a stamp. Uh, Bart Simpson has one, by the way, and so does Scooby-Doo. <laughs> we don't like that very much. Harriet Scott's marker is here as well. That was donated in 2006, and she's buried in Greenwood Cemetery. I want to thank all of you for attending today and hearing my story, but most of all, I want to encourage everybody out there, and I don't think I have to tell you guys, do your homework. We found out that two babies were buried with Dredd and Harriet in their graves. We did not know that until Ruth Ann Hager started to do her work. So be encouraged, use the resources that are here, and love one another and enjoy this journey because Roots Text 2024 is an amazing thing, and we are so blessed to be here today. God bless and thank you. Bless you. <laughs> thank you.
Wow. Can we just take a second to appreciate Lynn and her message, the heartfelt journey that she shared with us. Thank you, Lynn, for such a moving presentation. We'd like to keep this momentum going, these positive feelings that we're feeling as we go on to our next presenter, just as Lynn's efforts shed light on the stories of her family, American Ancestors is diving into a groundbreaking initiative that will have a profound impact for generations to come. Let's take a look. Many of our ancestors lived and died without any record to show they even existed. Like us, they had hopes, they had dreams, and they had names. I'm Henry Louis Gates Jr., host of the PBS series, Finding Your Roots. You're about to hear about a groundbreaking initiative that seeks to identify our 10 million ancestors by their given names. By 1865, 10 million Africans and African Americans had been enslaved in the United States. Prior to the 1870 census, the men, women, and children whose forced labor helped build this nation were listed as part of their enslavers' household inventory. We find them on property lists alongside the sheep and the horses and the cattle and the pigs. That's where we find black people listed as property. So you might have their names, an age, a sex, but what you won't have is their connections to other people. Harvard history professor Vincent Brown is among a council of black scholars, black genealogy groups, and individuals collaborating with the American ancestors to launch the historic 10 Million Names Project. American Ancestors is creating an online repository that will contain the documented family history enslaved Africans and African-Americans in the U.S. I would say that for many, many people living today, it is very difficult to get back to before emancipation, right? So um, genealogists offer, often refer to the brick wall of 1870. 1870 is the first federal census where we get a ton of names of African-Americans in the United States. Um, but there are names before 1870. And as a historian, I come across them all the time, as do my peers. It's just that it, we never quite imagined there would be one place where all this information could live and interact. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, President and CEO of American Ancestors, Ryan Woods. Thank you. I'm Ryan Woods, President and CEO of American Ancestors, the organization leading 10 million names. Our hope is that this initiative will amplify the voices of many individuals who have been telling the stories of their ancestors for years, and that it will spark an interest in family history in countless more people. 10 Million Names is not just a project. It is a deeply personal journey for me. Like so many Americans, my family history is diverse. My parents were an interracial couple married in the first generation after Loving v. Virginia. My father was born in Asia to a black U.S. serviceman and a Korean woman. My mother, born and raised in New England, is mainly of colonial American ancestry, with most of her forebearers having arrived in this country in the 17th century. My DNA composition appears as approximately 30% Korean, 49% British Isles, 15% West African, and 6% broadly Northwestern European. As a multiracial person with globally diverse ancestry, whose appearance is vaguely other, I have been asked on numerous occasions, what are you? It was a question that I struggled to answer with confidence and pride for years. What are you becomes who are you? And it taps into the inequality of access to genealogical information. 
I know the names of many of my white ancestors, but like millions of Americans of African descent, I do not know the names of many of my black ancestors. 10 million names is determined to make it easier for all African Americans to discover their ancestry. Now I want to share a video with you that illustrates what our project is about. Greetings, I'm Dorothy Tucker. I proudly served as the president of NABJ, the National Association of Black Journalists, a partner of the 10 Million Names Project. 10 Million Names is amplifying the voices of my ancestors. This important work will help millions of people. It's work that will last forever and will change history. This initiative is truly thrilling. I had the privilege of collaborating with lead researcher Lindsay Fulton to delve into my own genealogy, forging connections between my family and our enslaved ancestors. So these are the, the, the two plots of land that he, that he purchases, which is where the family lives today. This is a 320, 320 acres. 20 acres. Yeah. Oh my goodness. It, it is, it's so, it's kind of, you hear, you know, the oral history is passed along, um, and it's just something that you grow up knowing, but to actually see the map, yeah. see the documentation, yeah. you know, it, it really just kind of, it, it's so gratifying. The outcomes of this exploration were nothing short of captivating. I implore you to participate in this monumental project. If you have ancestors who enslaved people, or your ancestors were enslaved, Please let 10 million names know their names. Information shared has the potential to produce family connections. Help us make this happen. As you see, Dorothy's family history means so much to her. There are millions of stories like Dorothy's out there waiting to be recovered. As genealogists, you understand the power of family history and how that knowledge helps to ground you in a framework of people across time and place. Why should some people have access to their family history and not others? 10 Million Names unites genealogists, historians, families, and individuals in a single mission, to recover, restore, and remember family history. It will take us years to reach our goal of identifying as many of the 10 million names as we can, but we cannot do it without a collective community effort. If you descend from enslavers or enslaved persons, I invite you to visit 10millionnames.org to enter information you may have, upload photographs, documents, or tell your family's story. 10 Million Names is a life-changing initiative for many, and a significant contribution to American history for all. Thank you. What an honor it's been to have had the privilege to hear about one of the most important projects currently underway. After hearing the messages of this session, it's crystal clear that every narrative, every person is important, especially those who are closest to us. Our next keynote speaker certainly understands this. From the New York Times to galleries around the world, her work resonates deeply. And the accolades that she's earned, like the World Press Photo and the Humanitarian Award, they only just scratch the surface. It's Nancy's ability to capture raw emotion and untold stories that truly sets her apart. Please welcome to the stage, picture line sponsored Sony photographer, Nancy Borowick. Thank you. Thank you, Roots Tech and Family Search. Thank you, Picture Line and Sony. And thank you all for being here this morning. There I was, nine and a half months pregnant, standing in front of an audience at a funeral director's conference in Midtown Manhattan. 
I was the literal embodiment of life talking to these undertakers about the gifts that cancer and death gave my family. Most moms to be at my stage are probably at home nesting. I was fighting for every last inch of my identity as I knew it before life would completely change with the arrival of my baby boy 10 days later. Motherhood is the new lens through which I now see life and storytelling. And as with all things in life, the best way out is always through. Thank you, Robert Frost. So to start our conversation today, I'd like to ask a few questions. How do you want to be remembered? How do you remember those that you love? Is it the sights, the sounds, the smells? For me, it's through photographs. The year was 1979. The place, Long Island, New York. The hair was big, the sideburns long, the sleeves puffy, and the dance moves electric. It was Labor Day weekend, and my parents were tying the knot. They, made, they met in St. John's Law School in the musical review. Mom sang, dad danced, and they continued this dance for 34 years. By early December of 2012, mom was deep into chemotherapy treatment for a second recurrence with metastatic breast cancer when my father got his diagnosis. Stage four, pancreatic cancer. There they were, in treatment, together, side by side. And this was our new normal. I couldn't heal my parents, so I did what I knew how to do. I photographed them. I needed to hold on to them as much as I could, as long as I could. And what I realized pretty quickly was that the story that I was documenting and the story that we were experiencing wasn't about cancer and dying. It was about living. I believe that when you are faced with your own mortality, you truly begin to believe and understand what it means to be alive. No one wants to talk about death, but we had to. They wanted to. And talking about death was one of the greatest gifts that cancer gave us. That said, my parents did not want to be defined as cancer patients, and they certainly didn't want to be pitied. My mother was this beautiful, generous, selfless soul, and my father was boisterous and passionate and larger than life. Having lived outside of our home since high school graduation, it was a bit of a novelty to have me around. But they eventually got used to me and forgot I was there, like during this moment when they got a call about scan results. <sighs> what if one had good news and one had bad news? Do you celebrate for yourself and mourn for the person you love the most in the world? We did our best to follow doctor's orders. <laughs> Dad lost nearly 40 pounds overnight, and he needed to take in as many calories as he could stomach. So we did as the doctor instructed, and to no one's surprise, 
he gained weight. We all gained weight. <laughs> there was a lot of love, a lot of joy, and a lot of dancing. And I decided to show this personal journal of photographs to a mentor of mine, worried that maybe I was too close to the story and I would miss something. And ultimately, she insisted that I share the story in a more public way, that maybe it would help other through, others going through something similar. So I submitted the photographs to a contest. I did not win the prize, but I won something much more valuable, an email. An email from an editor at the New York Times saying he wanted to publish our story. <laughs> the story for the paper needed a climax, however, and fortunately and luckily we had an event to fit the bill. A wedding. Mine. <laughs> My husband and I had gotten engaged a few months prior and decided to expedite the wedding for the sake of my parents. I think it served as a distraction, and it gave us all something to look forward to. We picked a date, October 5th, 2013. And when the day came, my parents walked me down the aisle, arm in arm, on that warm fall afternoon in the apple orchard. Two weeks later, life changed forever. The story was published in the New York Times, and my inbox was flooded. It is amazing how alone you can feel when you're going through something like terminal illness. And here we were, the least alone we had ever felt. I grieved with every letter that came in, but I also felt a deep connection with each and every one. This was our story, but it was everyone's narrative. The very same weekend that the story ran, my father was admitted to the hospital. He was jaundiced and in a lot of pain. And it had become clear that his quality of life had sharply diminished. A do not resuscitate order was signed. A bracelet was attached to his wrist. And he lay there with a certain peacefulness about him. Remove the machines and the wires. He could be at the beach without a care in the world. This was his decision to make. We wanted him to fight, but that's what we wanted. And he had had time to make this decision. Both of his parents died when he was just a child of cancer. And he never thought he would live as long as he did and was grateful for the time that he did have. Dad died on December 7th, 2013. It was the 40th anniversary of his mother's death and a year and a day since diagnosis. He would have loved his funeral. There he was, center of attention, surrounded by everyone he adored in the world. When I asked him if he was curious about what people might say about him at his funeral, he said, I don't wonder. I wrote it. <laughs> he then gave me his eulogy. It was 14 pages long. <laughs> but life moves on, so the project continued. My mother was the opposite of my father and hated to be the center of attention. I think she found purpose in the distraction from her disease that caring for my father gave her. 
having been sick on and off for 18 years, cancer was just another item on her to-do list. She was the queen of to-do lists. I get that from her. And to me, her lists screamed life. Order Howie's headstone. Decide regarding radiation. One exclamation point. Join the gym and start going. Four exclamation points. And my all-time favorite, what happened to the Girl Scout cookies? All of equal importance and all on a note. There's really only so much a person can take, and by the following fall, my mom's health started to take a turn for the worst. One night, while lying in bed beside her, she asked me if I could start looking into home hospice care. I said, of course. As I slowly turned my head to the other side of the pillow so she wouldn't see me starting to cry. I couldn't believe we were at this place. She had been sick for so much of my life. I kind of thought she'd just be sick forever but still be there, as unfair as that is. It was hard to find levity in the final days of my mom's life, but lucky for us, we had Moses, a friend's dog, who would sit on her chest and snort with every breath. Mom watched Dad die in the hospital with machines beeping, fluorescent lights glaring, and a slew of doctors and nurses who were practically strangers. She didn't want that. She wanted to be at home, in her pajamas, listening to James Taylor, and surrounded by her family. So that's what we did. And as, you know, we watched her chest rise and fall, we all kind of looked around at each other, checking in. You okay? You okay? And she stopped breathing. December 6, 2014. 364 days after my father passed away, we were back in the temple. Only this time, the seat next to my brother sat empty. Not too long after she died, my siblings and I decided to start the daunting task of cleaning out our family home. And to my surprise, it was actually a really beautiful experience. We uncovered letters they wrote to one another, shoe boxes of four by sixes, even teeth collected by the tooth fairy. What do you keep? What really matters in the end? This is a bit of a challenge for me, as I'm a bit of a collector. But I think back to something my mother shared with me before she died. She said, the people you love, they live on inside of you, because they are already a part of the person that you are. I am my mother's daughter, and I get to keep that forever. In Jewish tradition, you return to the cemetery a year after the loss to honor the person that you lost. We call it an unveiling. Because of the timing of my mother's death, we decided to hold off on the unveiling and honor my parents together, side by side, when we were ready. Life determined the end of the photographic part of this project, but I wasn't done telling the story. I wanted to memorialize my parents' story in some way, to give it the gravitas and the lasting legacy I felt it deserved. So, I set about creating a scrapbook that could contain all of the love and wonder and joy they shared to the very end. The story took on a life of its own, 
And it has become a mission of mine to reframe the conversation around end of life and illness and hopefully help others in the process. Remembering is everything. Family is everything. Jobs come and go, relationships come and go, but family, whatever that looks like for you, that is everlasting. And I want to conclude this morning with a few words from my father. Remember what we Borowicz already know. The universe never promised any of us longevity. I have outlived each of my parents by decades and lived well beyond what I had predicted or even bargained for. Longevity aside, you should know, if you do not know already, that I believe I have been the luckiest man to have ever lived on this planet, so I'm comfortable with the time that I've had. My kids, Jessica, Nancy, and Matthew. Wow, three beautiful flowers in my garden. Thank you for your love and what each of you has contributed to the magic of our family. Look for me in every sunset. Thank you. Can you stay out here with me? Huh? Mind staying out here with me? Oh, sure, time? yeah. Okay. Should I put this down? Yes, all, my <laughs> all my stuff. Thank you so much, Nancy. That's not fair that I have to come out here now. I'm a mess. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. For sharing that. So beautiful. Um, before you came out, there uh, were some family search researchers that uh, came and met with you. Right. What were some of the things that they shared with you, and what were some of your impressions? Well, we didn't have five hours, so we couldn't go through everything. <laughs> yeah. um, but they shared with me stories and, and just these little bits of, of highlights that I didn't know about my family. They showed me pictures of my great-great-grandfather's home um, that is now a temple. No way. Which is wild in Brooklyn. I, as soon as I'm back there, I'm going to have to check it out. What, what does that mean to you? What, what do you think when you see that? As, since my parents died, it's, uh, we, just, uh, we just had the 10-year anniversary since my father died. You know, I have lots of questions. Yeah. And when you've lost someone, you know that you kind of have to be okay with those questions never being answered. And I'm okay with that. But then when I get some answers and I get some clues, I'm yes. like, I just want to dig in. <laughs> like, I, I just, it's, I feel like I know more about myself, which is so cool because, you know, I'm 38. I feel like I know myself. Right, right. But clearly there's more to learn. And I, I can't wait to just get home and share it with the rest of my family and spend time with it um, because we really have not had clear records. We've had stories yes. that have been passed down, but with no living parents and no living grandparents, those stories are just stories that I can't verify. I can't ask follow-up questions. You know, I wish I was a, journal, a real journalist then. I could have known what to ask, maybe, but I'm a, I'm a person, I'm a human, <laughs> I'm a daughter. I, I'm just so grateful. Yes. To be here, to have had that experience, I, I'm still processing it. Yeah. Well, you have such a beautiful thing to give to your children, to show them. You've documented something beautiful, profound, and poignant. What have they said when, when you've shared this with them? How, how have they reacted? Well, my children are four and one. Right. So. <laughs> But we've got, a group, yet. we've got a group here that's excited to share yeah. stories like this with their grandkids and with their kids. Yeah. What, what is it that you're going to tell them? You know, it's weird that it's been 10 years because it doesn't feel like it. Mm. And 
because I get to share this story and because I have these photographs, I remember my parents so vividly. I remember them at their highs. I remember them at their lows. And that helps me remember who they were, you know? Like, not just the smiling, happy family photos. And I can't wait to tell them about Grandma Laurel and Grandpa Howie, who would have been the best grandparents. And it's, you know, it's something I'm going to have to navigate, but I know that they're going to be grateful, like, to have the collection I made for them. They're going to be grateful for the Family Search collection. One of the greatest gifts I think that a, a friend gave me when I was working on the project was that there were times when I was nervous to ask my parents questions. I didn't want to upset them. Right. I didn't want to remind them that they were dying. <laughs> and my friend said to me, you know, you're not really reminding them. Like, they know what's happening. Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe they want to share. You don't know unless you ask. And I guess not to my not surprise, they, oh, uh, my, <laughs> my mother, you know, it took a minute for her to share. My father, side story, I set up a camera. I did a video interview. Um, and we sat down and I asked a few questions. And then I stopped talking and he spoke for six hours. Oh my goodness. Well, he's got a 14-page eulogy, I guess. <laughs> it, was, it was very on brand, Howie uh, Borowick. Yes. So it's a gift. I, I see that my parents gave me this gift, sharing this with me, and my hope is that my kids one day see that um, and, and appreciate it. You know, I have a, a one-year-old and four-year-old, and I'm working on their, ch their albums. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying. It's like the, the cobbler's kids are the ones that go without shoes, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. so what characteristics do you see in your kids now that came from your parents? Oh, my goodness. Um, my older son, Levi, is a jokester. Mm -hmm. um, and he, that he gets that, I think he gets that from my father. He likes to see reactions and things like that. Oof. Well, Gus is only 14 months, so we're just starting to see a little personality come out in him. Yeah. But he's so sweet and loving. I, I, it really does... Motherhood has really opened my eyes and allowed me to feel my parents in a different way again. Yes. And that, like, you know, it, like... I feel them with me, and that is... I'm so lucky. Because if I can't have them here, like, I, I can still have them here. Yes. Um, so it's a process. Yes. <laughs> Nancy, and we are so lucky that we were able to have you here. Thank you so much for oh being here Oh, my gosh. Today. Thank you so much. This was such a wonderful experience. Thank you. Everybody, Nancy. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. I've gone through 23 tissues already, you guys. <laughs> I don't know about you, but this is so beautiful, what we have felt today. Um, but we have one more day. The adventure doesn't stop here. Join us bright and early tomorrow morning. We're going to have so much fun. Uh, the Family Search Global Forum starts at 9.30 a.m., followed by our closing general session. I can't see what I'm supposed to say because I have too many tears. <clears throat> I apologize. We've got even more incredible tales of discovery that are lined up just for you. And don't wait until then to dive in. You need to explore the great classes. I can see some of you leaving right now. Get into those classes and discover the Expo Hall. Enjoy all of the activities happening right here at the Saul Palace or online at rootstech.org. And young adults, if you're 18 to 31, make sure you join us back here tonight at the Saul Palace at 7 p.m because it's time for our second annual Roots Tech After Party. We've got live music, games, food, and vendors, and even a chance to get involved and make a difference with the Family History Service Project. Trust me, it's going to be amazing. I'll see you all again tomorrow, bright and early. Thank you. Be kind to each other and lift each other up. Thank you. Um...